The episodes featured in this video first aired in 1970, which is also the same year the Beatles broke up. That makes all the following spoilers seem not so important, doesn't it? While heading to a rock concert, the temperamental mystery machine once again strands the gang, this time in front of a haunted mansion where they get terrorized by a headless specter. Penrod Stillwall was the great-great-great-grandson of the mansion's original owner, Jefferson Stillwall. Desperate to find a lost treasure purportedly hidden somewhere on the estate, he invented the headless specter to scare off anyone else who might find it before him. Incidentally, I thought I might have caught the Scooby writers using bad historical math again when describing Penrod Stillwall as the great-great-great-grandson of Jefferson Stillwall, but it does seem to check out. So good for them! Unbeknownst to Penrod Stillwall, his greedy neighbor, Aza Shanks, launched his own scheme to get hold of the hidden treasure. This was an atypical episode because not only were there two different Scooby villains operating separately, technically one of them wasn't even a villain so I'll have to rank each one separately. Starting with Penrod Stillwall, his plot was to discourage trespassers by dressing up as the ghost of his ancestor while searching for clues to the treasure's whereabouts. He also employed large ghost-shaped helium balloons, floating candles, and a portrait that was rigged to lose its head. At first, this entire plot seemed unnecessary as Penrod Stillwall ostensibly had a legal right to be on the property as the implied owner. I say implied because it's never firmly established that Penrod Stillwall actually owned the mansion. It's possible there were issues involving the estate and he could have been fighting family members for possession. It's also possible that the property was sold off years earlier or the Stillwall clan otherwise lost possession of it through tax sale or defaulting on a mortgage. The mansion certainly looks like it hasn't been used in decades. In fact, this plot makes more sense if there were other family members or owners who had a claim on the property and Penrod Stillwall was trying to scare them off. It stands to reason that if he knew the family legend of the lost treasure, the rest of his relatives would as well. If he was the actual owner, instead of scaring people away as the headless specter, Penrod Stillwall could have simply called the police to deal with any trespassers. As questionable as this scheme was, Aza Shanks didn't even exert that much effort with his own, which consisted of nothing more than sneaking into the mansion to randomly chop away at attic walls with an axe. This was simply breaking and entering to commit vandalism. It wouldn't surprise me if Aza Shanks had a shed full of stolen catalytic converters in his backyard. Still, neither of the two antagonists' plans were very high risk. If caught for trespassing or criminal mischief, it's likely they'd face probation or at worst a month or two of incarceration or community service well worth it for a potential fortune. Should the authorities be summoned, the mansion's remote location and hidden fruit cellar makes getting away quick and easy for Penrod Stillwall, while Aza Shanks could just run to his nearby home to hide out. This makes the chance of getting caught low for both parties. For their respective designs, and without knowing Penrod Stillwall's status as the legal property owner, he gets a 2.5 out of 5. And Aza Shanks gets a 1 out of 5. When ranking villain outfits, particularly those of ghosts, I often dwell on whether their costumes feature anything that helps sell the supernatural aspect of the design, with glowing or transparency being the usual focus, as those two effects are traditionally the most common. Despite the lack of either for Penrod Stillwall's headless specter, the lack of a head is more than adequate to sell the otherworldly nature of the threat. Using his ancestor's apparel is also a good choice, as old clothing itself can be disturbing both from the aesthetics as well as the practicality. Nobody would be scared of a lost spirit wearing Crocs. For myself, Georgian and Victorian era clothing always fills me with a sense of unease. Specifically, how did they comfortably use a toilet wearing all that heavy wool and cotton? As someone with occasional bathroom emergencies requiring a rapid removal of clothing, the idea of having to claw through five or more layers in time has its own way of scaring the hell out of me. Oh, 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 my aching head! Hey, oh, you really have oh. a head! Penrod Stillwall also deserves praise for how well he's able to tuck his head inside the costume, doing a very good job at selling the headless nature of the ghost. 
extra points too for not having any obvious eye holes cut into the front of the jacket. However, the idea itself of the Headless Spectre seems arbitrary, as nothing in this episode indicates that Jefferson Stillwall was killed by decapitation, unlike, say, the Headless Horseman from The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, who famously lost his head in battle. If anything, Penrod Stillwall just made it more difficult for himself having to cram his head into his dead ancestor's clothes. My neck gets a painful crick that lasts for days if I happen to fall asleep with my head at just the wrong angle. Old Penrod will probably end up spending half that fortune on orthopedic surgery. As for the episode's B villain, I've probably made it clear by now how I feel about ghost disguises that are nothing more than sheets with holes cut in them. And Aza Shanks isn't even wearing one big enough to cover his entire body. I have bath towels bigger than that! For his headless specter, Penrod Stillwall gets a 4 out of 5, while Aza Shanks gets a 1 out of 5 for his ghost getup that would have made the Maitlands cringe. Though ultimately unsuccessful, Penrod Stillwall did manage to operate his scheme with some level of competency. His use of props, with one notable exception, helped sell the idea that the mansion was haunted and would normally result in most people being too afraid to remain on the estate. No? It's Jefferson Stillwall! <laughs> It's only a wooden dummy. Somebody did it to deliberately scare us. While the fake head in the box provides for a good jump scare, it was a mistake as it not only proved that someone was faking the headless ghost, but that there was probably a reason that same someone wanted to scare off curious snoopers. Why would someone go through all this trouble if there wasn't something valuable they were trying to hide? It's like the Streisand effect, but for hidden treasure. Look, guys. There's a light in that old haunted mansion. Apart from the wooden head, Penrod Stillwall's use of candles was also a mistake, as it was the light in the mansion that led the gang to go inside in the first place. Had it remained dark, they would have had no reason to investigate the empty building, as all they needed was water for the mystery machine. Furthermore, Penrod Stillwall made up the story of the Headless Spectre to scare people away, but clearly this wasn't good enough as it didn't deter Azer Shanks from attempting to find the treasure himself. In fact, the Headless Spectre shenanigans ended up providing good cover for Azer Shanks' own attempts at locating the lost fortune, as he was able to spend his time in the attic undisturbed by either Penrod Stillwall or the Scooby Gang. Of course, Aza Shank's actions proved even less effective in the end, as all he did in the episode was draw attention to himself by loudly chopping away at the attic walls. And while Penrod Stillwall loses points for getting caught by accident, Aza Shank scores even lower for his humiliating capture from a simple jump rope. Neither villain did attempt to kill the gang, though admittedly one was willing to cause at least a few bruises. Ultimately, this lack of bloodlust proved good for both in avoiding any potentially long prison sentences, considering how the treasure they were so desperately searching for probably ended up being nearly worthless. It's a diary, and the last entry was dated July 12, 1822. Marching men in single file hide the secret. Stillwall shows the way. The diary entry with the clue for finding the hidden fortune was dated 1822. The eventual treasure found by the gang consisted of a carpet bag filled with what appears to be dollar bills. The thing is, paper money like that wasn't printed by the U.S. government until the beginning of the Civil War, about 40 years later. What Penrod Stillwall is holding is likely a bag filled with private banknotes from before 1861 and thus worthless as legal U.S. tender. Forget the space kook. The biggest villain in the Scooby-Doo franchise is the series writer's disregard for historical accuracy. One could argue that a private collector might be found who'd be interested in purchasing the banknotes at above their face value, but would any collector be interested in wads of paper that spent a century and a half crammed inside a moldy carpet bag? The front pillar of a dilapidated mansion is not a climate-controlled setting, and it's unlikely those bills would have been in usable condition even if they had been actual U.S. currency. Between this and the old Confederate money featured in the Green Ghosts episode, the producers really love to use worthless currency in their stories. The value of the hidden treasure aside, 
I'm giving Penrod Stillwall a 3 out of 5 for his operation, and surprising no one, Aza Shanks gets a 1 out of 5. This gives the Headless Spectre a due score of 3.2 out of 5, while Aza Shanks joins Carl the Stuntman with a 1 out of 5. No one ever met the Headless Spectre and lived to tell it. Why would he blow out his lantern? Is he going to walk home in the dark? Ghosts! Ghosts? Where? We might have known a Scooby Ghost. That's all it is. The non-material embodiment or essence or organism that's seen as a specter, wraith, or apparition has been scientifically proven to be a sheer myth. There's no such thing as a ghost! This is the 22nd episode of Scooby-Doo, and Velma is mocking Shaggy and Scooby for thinking they saw a ghost? Why is that so hard for her to believe? Seeing ghosts is an everyday occurrence for the Scooby gang. It's probably the headless specter. Or a ghost? Like your ghost in the well, Scooby. Oh, let it go, Velma. A Hawaiian vacation turns spooky when a witch doctor interrupts Shaggy and Scooby's luau to drive away those trespassing on the sacred grounds of the pagan god Manotikitia. Newspaper reporter Mr. Sims hatched a plot to steal pearls farmed by a Hawaiian fishing village, and in order to scare the residents away, dressed as a witch doctor while his henchmen controlled a moving giant stone idol. Trespassers, hear me! You are on the forbidden ground of Mono Tiki Tia! Leave at once! This is yet another scare everyone away by using local superstition scheme, but with heavy cultural appropriation and just a dash of brown face. Though, not as bad as it could be. But how necessary was wearing disguises for this particular villain design? The fishing village controlled an oyster patch that seemed to be bountiful in pearls. Traditionally, the pearls would be harvested by villagers regularly diving into the sea to bring up oysters in hopes they contain gemstones. If they had been successful at driving away the villagers, were Mr. Sims and his henchmen planning on diving and farming the oysters themselves, or was he simply planning on stealing the ones already harvested? If the former, driving the villagers away would be necessary. If the latter, a simple breaking and entering would be enough since none of the huts look like they're built like a bank vault, and there would have been no need for disguises or the mechanical parade float. Then again, the entire premise of this episode is built on one potentially major misunderstanding. Despite Pearl Harbor being arguably one of its most famous locations, Hawaii isn't exactly famous for producing pearls. That's Tahiti. I'm guessing the Scooby Riders confused the two island locales, despite them being over 2,600 miles away from each other. That'd be like saying Arizona was known for its lobster industry because of how close it is to Maine. This episode should have been set in Tahiti, but we'll ignore that and take everything at face value and assume these Hawaiian villagers were successfully harvesting pearls. It's difficult to evaluate the potential rewards for Mr. Sim's scheme for several reasons, but for now, let's just look at the pearls discovered by Fred and Daphne. First, the actual value of what's on the table is difficult to determine. We don't know what the pearl market would have been like on a given day in 1970. At least, I have no idea, and Google hasn't been that helpful finding the answer. If going by today's prices, a single quality natural saltwater pearl has the potential to be valued at anywhere from a few hundred dollars to well over a thousand. For our purposes here, let's just say a single pearl could sell for $300 on the low end and $1,500 on the high end. In 1970, that would be between $40 to $200. That's per pearl. Fred and Daphne found what appears to be at least 150 of them. That would place the total sum value of what's on that table from anywhere between $6,000 to $30,000 in 1970, or around $45,000 to $230,000 in today's money. 
I keep describing the value of the pearls using a range of dollar amounts because the second reason we can't say for certain what the pearls were worth is because their selling price is determined by several factors we don't know. Type, color, weight, surface condition, luster, all are used to determine what a buyer would pay, so every pearl on that table would need to be appraised separately. Finally, we don't know if what's on the table represents all the pearls stolen by Mr. Sims. I suspect it is considering just how rare natural pearls are to find in the first place, but unfortunately the episode provides contradictory evidence for how long the fake witch doctor and his henchmen were operating. At the beginning of the episode, we see the villagers happily enjoying a luau before the witch doctor appears to drive them away, implying this was the first time he showed up. Had he appeared before, it's unlikely the villagers would be so casually enjoying a feast and would instead be hiding in their huts or simply have already abandoned their homes entirely. However, the undercover policeman at the end says he had been investigating the pearl poachers for a long time, meaning Mr. Sims and his henchmen had been at it for a while. Either way, I'm satisfied believing what was found by Fred and Daphne was likely the entirety of the stolen loot, because if pearls were so easy to find, they wouldn't be so expensive. $230,000 seems rather paltry for two men to risk prison, not to mention all the expenses they had to have incurred building the mechanical stone idol. And while print journalism may be on the decline today, back in the 1970s, it was generally a well-paying career. Mr. Sim's annual salary could have conceivably been close to $10,000, or around $70,000 in today's money. The fact that he was hosting the Scooby Gang meant he likely wasn't hurting financially. If he had gambling or credit card debts, he wouldn't be in the position to treat Shaggy and Scooby to luau's. Certainly, $230,000 is a nice figure, but again, that's the high end of the pearl market, and there was no guarantee they would sell for that much. Even if they did, and assuming Mr. Sims and his henchmen split their ill-gotten gains equally, the journalist's scheme would earn him less than two years' salary. I'm going to give Mr. Sims a 2 out of 5 for design. The money involved would be worth it for some, but probably not for a reasonably high-paid professional. As alluded earlier, Mr. Sims' choice of disguise definitely reeks of cultural appropriation. Although in his defense, if you're going to try to terrorize a rural village using their religious beliefs, you might have to break a few brown face eggs to make that omelet. So let's set that aside. I mean, it's not like he rose from the waters and shouted racial slurs at them. I do have to hand it to Mr. Sims. Going barefoot to maintain the integrity of his disguise shows a lot of dedication. I don't even go barefoot to walk downstairs to check my mail. This attention to detail doesn't carry over to other aspects of the costumes, however. The Mono Tiki Tia stone idol is clearly on wheels and sounds mechanical, while the witch doctor threatens the villagers in English rather than the Hawaiian language. Mr. Sims and his henchmen do use some special effects, though, like the smoke cloud to announce the appearance of the witch doctor, but how in the hell did they cause the sky to cloud over and everything turn red? There's no explanation given for that in the episode, so I'm chalking it up to coincidence, like how Columbus allegedly used a scheduled lunar eclipse to hoodwink some islanders. In terms of originality, this is the second time a witch doctor appears as a villain in the series, and also played by a white guy so no points there. How intimidating their costumes were is also subjective, as one would likely have to subscribe to whatever religion or supernatural belief is served by the witch doctor, though I suppose anyone would get unnerved by having a dude in a giant mask waving a stick with a skull at them. And a giant moving stone statue that could conceivably step on you doesn't have to rely on superstition to evoke fear. So I'll give Mr. Sims and his henchmen a 2.5 out of 5 for their outfits. Not original or very supernatural, but scary enough in terms of the potential for bodily harm. You know how I keep harping on how kidnapping Daphne is always a very stupid idea for the bad guy? 
Hold it. This will make a good picture for my newspaper. How's this? <laughs> this tour you've taken us on is the greatest, Mr. Sims. Bringing the Scooby Gang to your crime scene is even worse. I mean, there's asking for trouble, and there's holding a gun to Trouble's head and demanding an empty the cash register. Now let's find Mr. Sims. Let's don't. <laughs> Shame on you two. After all, he's our host. Further, not only does Mr. Sims invite the gang to where he's staging his heist, he kidnaps himself, giving them even more incentive to stick their meddling noses in. As for the crime itself, Mr. Sims was able to steal quite a lot of pearls, though as mentioned earlier, not nearly enough to make the scheme financially worthwhile. In fact, driving away the people harvesting the pearls is the best way to ensure that the supply will dry up, because these two can't be expected to spend their days diving for oysters. The biggest unanswered question of the entire episode, though, is the wrecked airplane that Shaggy, Velma, and Scooby run across. It's established that the plane was not a legitimate wreck and was covered with fake plastic vines to make it look like it had been there for a long time. It was also rigged with a fake skeleton that would laugh if anyone stumbled over the tripwire. This airplane is never mentioned again, nor does it seem to fit with Mr. Sims' plot to scare off the villagers from their oyster beds. Is it possible there were multiple criminal schemes happening at the same time in that area and the gang stumbled onto one unrelated to Mano Tiki Tia? As per the usual Scooby-Doo show routine, the Witch Doctor and Stone Idol pop up occasionally to scare the gang from clue to clue until they inevitably get trapped. While the Witch Doctor does little more than lunge at the teenagers, the guy driving the Stone Idol takes things seriously by almost managing to flatten Shaggy and Scooby. Perhaps Mr. Sims wasn't too keen on murdering the kids he'd been hanging out with, but his henchmen didn't have any qualms the attempted homicide bumps up what would have otherwise been an abysmal operation score for the Pearl Poachers. Three out of five. This gives Mr. Sims and his henchmen a due score of 2.5 out of five. We find out later the old man was really a young cop investigating the pearl thieves, but apparently stakeouts get boring, so why not let off some steam by scaring teenagers? We'll need a torch. Shh. Wow. At least Mr. Sims was nice enough to provide a soft landing for his trapdoor. Zeb and Zeke could have learned better kidnapping etiquette from him. <laughs> <laughs> Poof! I think you're full of poi. Thanks, Velma. Like in another moment, that freaky tiki would have made poi out of this boy. <laughs> Scooby Doo, come back here with my poi! <laughs> Hey, does anyone know the name of any Hawaiian dishes? Poi. Thanks, Bill. Any others? Any others? <laughs> By the way, poi is purple, not yellow. You know what can be yellow? Banana poi, a traditional dish in Tahiti. This episode should have been set in Tahiti. While relaxing at a campsite, an eerie howl and a set of glowing red eyes prompts the gang to investigate a series of footprints that lead to an encounter with another werewolf. Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Werewolf breaks the usual Scooby-Doo episode structure by not introducing any ancillary characters as possible suspects. The unmasked villain never even gets a name. He's only ever referred to as a sheep rustler. Calling him sheep rustler throughout this analysis is a bit awkward, so I'll just refer to him as Nathaniel from now on. Nathaniel's crime was smuggling sheep by way of floating them in barrels across a river to a waiting barge, much like how Greenway and Leech used hollowed-out logs for the same purpose. 
But unlike those jewel smugglers who needed a way to get their stolen loot across the border, there's never anything in this episode that indicates why the sheep smugglers had to cross that particular river. No one ever mentions a border to another state or country. The crime is also referred to as both smuggling and rustling, so it's unclear if the sheep were even stolen in the first place. There are other reasons to smuggle contraband, like avoiding costly tariffs or other legislative restrictions on animal transportation, such as in cases where an epidemic is affecting a certain farm population. Without knowing the origin of the sheep, or even if they were stolen in the first place, it's difficult to ascertain why Nathaniel went through the effort of laying railway tracks, modifying barrels to safely transport livestock, and rigging barge compartments with hydraulics. It's possible the authorities were on high alert and patrolling the highways looking for any signs of smuggling, but this still seems like a very convoluted method of achieving results. I'm giving this plot a 2 out of 5. It may have been working before the Scooby Gang got involved, but making things this complicated is just asking for trouble. This is the second werewolf to appear in Scooby-Doo Where Are You, and there's nothing more to the disguise than the usual rubber mask and shabby clothing, so Nathaniel gets nothing for originality. And look, there are more wolf tracks leading away from the grave. Oh, swell, it ain't bad enough we're following a werewolf, now it looks like it's the ghost of a werewolf. Ghost? <laughs> oh, for crying out loud, there they go again, tossing ghosts around as a catch-all. Like a werewolf isn't supernatural enough? Regardless, if it breaks out of a grave, that's not a ghost. That's a zombie. Admittedly, a werewolf is frightening, so it's not a bad choice for an unimaginative villain's costume if they can't come up with anything better. It's like how high school graduates have a safety school as a second or third choice for college if they can't get accepted in the university they really want. Werewolves are the Purdue University of Scooby Villain Disguises. Even for all that, this particular werewolf outfit must have been extremely well crafted, because Shaggy didn't even notice anything fake while cutting the monster's hair. It would have been readily apparent if Nathaniel had been wearing just a cheap dollar store wig. I'll give our sheep rustler a 3 out of 5 for his outfit. Various events in this episode made me question the entire concept of the villain's whole operation, even the true identity of the villain themselves. Something wrong, sir? First of all, the bad guy takes a lot of punishment. More so than the typical Scooby villain. Even Carl the Stuntman. It's easy to feel sorry for the antagonist this time around. It's been entirely too long since we've seen our friend the werewolf. <laughs> I knew it was too good to last. This is a moderately sized ship, and as mentioned in the Redbeard episode, vessels usually require a crew. Google says a barge would need a minimum of at least three sailors to manage, but this craft has a fully equipped barbershop, implying many more crew members than that. A solitary individual would have a difficult, if not impossible, time manning this ship. We just couldn't figure out how those sheep rustlers got them across the river without being seen. First, they'd shear them here in the mill. Then they'd ship them off to the black market somewhere. How those sheep rustlers got them across the river. They'd shear them. They'd ship them off. The cop and Fred keep referring to the sheep rustlers in the plural, but only Nathaniel was caught. Considering how inept the werewolf was, I say it's more than possible he was just some patsy a smuggling crew set up to take the fall while they made their escape. Like a hapless cabin boy or something. All the evidence points to at least more than one villain, and the real masterminds managed to get away with it. Sure, their operation here fell apart, but nothing says they can't set up shop somewhere else in the country. If they were smart enough to dupe Nathaniel into doing their dirty work, they probably took steps to keep him from having any information that would lead authorities to them. I'm giving this operation a score of 4 out of 5. Because despite Nathaniel's incompetence, he couldn't have been the main culprit. 
and they got away with it. This gives the sheep smuggling ring a do score of 3 out of 5. Incidentally, for an episode involving smuggling sheep, you never see a single sheep the entire time. You hear one, but it never shows up on screen. For some reason, the bad guy was always a colonel who had a beautiful young daughter and about a thousand head of cattle which you'd hear but never see. Mmm, those hot dogs are beginning to smell delicious. Mm. Yum, 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 yum. First they grill the hot dogs, then they roast them on forks. How much cooking do they need? Judging from the size, outline, and general configuration, I would say they are definitely the tracks of a large wolf. Those look nothing like wolf tracks. More superhuman strength. It's not an anchor, but an empty wooden barrel of that size weighs at least 100 pounds, and the werewolf tossed it 100 feet and with enough momentum that it continued to roll after it landed. But how could these rail cars just simply disappear into that old barge, Shaggy? Yeah, and what do you mean the deckhouse tips up and they go inside? Being chased by a werewolf is one thing, but a hydraulic compartment on a barge is apparently where Fred's credulity draws the line. You know how Freddy and Velma are when they got a mystery to unsolve? Oh no! If you unsolve a mystery, wouldn't that make it more mysterious? You gals get up on the deckhouse and give me directions. Right! Freddy, let the hook go! Stand clear! Help! Help! Freddy, come quick! Yow! Grab her! Okay, that one is completely on you, Fred. Who's the danger-prone one now? The gang's appearance on a television dance contest abruptly ends as a giant wax monster arrives to cause mayhem. KLMN TV station manager Mr. Stevens planned on escaping the country after embezzling a satchel full of money from the company's safe. To cover up his crime, he created a wax monster based on threats the station had received from eccentric old wax maker Mr. Grisby. To determine if this crime was worth the effort, we first need to figure out how much money Mr. Stevens stole from the station. Looking at the size of the case in Velma's hands, which appears to be a medium satchel, roughly the size of a traditional doctor's bag, I estimate the volume to be about 1,200 cubic inches. If a single dollar bill has a volume of roughly 0 0.07 cubic inches, this means when closed, that case could possibly hold 17,000 individual bills, and as those bills explode out of the top when Velma opens it, it was clearly packed nearly to capacity. We can't determine the denomination of those bills, meaning how many ones, fives, tens, twenties, fifties, or $100 bills there are, so this makes the possible amount of money in that bag anywhere from $17,000 to $1.7 million. In today's money, that would be between $130,000 and $13 million. That's a wide range, and it's not likely that a TV station vault would have contained over $10 million in today's money but it is feasible to split the difference and consider that the station might have had several hundred thousand dollars in its safe at the time it was robbed. I'm referring to several hundred thousand dollars in the 1970s, or a little under three million dollars in today's money. It's initially difficult to accept that a TV station would have had that much cash in its safe, but there could be any number of reasons for it. As odd as it might sound for those of us accustomed to checks and direct deposits, in those days it wasn't that unusual for companies to deal in cash, including for paying their staff. After all, there was a time when it wasn't uncommon for large businesses to hire armored cars to deliver their payroll from the bank. The average annual salary at the time was around $10,000, or roughly $200 per week. If the TV station employed 50 people, around $10,000 in cash would have had to be on hand by each payday. But who can say that the money in the safe was only for one week's payroll? Perhaps all that cash was earmarked for an entire month. That would be over $40,000 right there. 
It's also possible that KLMN was the flagship office for a multitude of stations and were holding the payroll for several different locations. Payroll isn't the only thing a company has to pay, so plenty of that cash could have been there to cover monthly expenses. There's also the likelihood some of that money came from advertising clients. It's even possible that the station owner didn't trust banks, and all their profits and personal holdings were kept in that safe. All of this is pure supposition, but it would still allow for the case Velma was holding to be filled with well over $300,000, or around $2.5 million in today's money. For many of us, that wouldn't be enough to retire on, but Mr. Stevens was well into his middle ages. For the number of years likely remaining in his lifetime, he could conceivably enjoy an extremely comfortable retirement, particularly if spent in a foreign country with a lower cost of living than the United States. I was discussing this with a friend, and he wondered if there could be anything other than paper money in the bag, like gold bars or something. I immediately dismissed this because if that bag was filled with gold, it would be too heavy for Velma to lift. Then I remembered... <laughs> faster, Velma! Faster! Run! Oh, get out of here! Come on! Get out of here! Come on! <laughs> Regardless, we both agreed that while there were plenty of arguments as to how the station could be carrying that much cash in the safe, there was no logical reason for there to have been anything else of value apart from perhaps property deeds or stock certificates, neither of which would do Mr. Stevens much good in South America. The potential reward for the Wax Phantom crime was definitely worth the risk, especially considering the authorities would focus on Mr. Grisby as the prime suspect since he was on record threatening the station. Enter! Yes, sir! Shh! There's a cemetery nearby. <laughs> What? I've never understood that line. Is Mr. Grisby suggesting that the people buried in the cemetery need their sleep because they have to wake up early in the morning for work? Maybe we should call the police. No. The station's in financial trouble already, and this kind of publicity could close it. Since when does Fred want to call the police before they capture the monster? Got a hot date, Fred? Maybe he does. This line does seem to contradict everything I just said about how much cash would be in the safe, but just because the station is in financial trouble doesn't mean it can't have plenty of liquid assets available. It's possible the cash in the safe represented all the funds left for KLMN to pay expenses for the next month or two, with no more to spend after that. Indeed, the station going broke gives a very good motive for Mr. Stevens' crime. As the manager, he would know better than anyone whether he'd still have a job in a few months. Panic over his employment might have been the push he needed to rob his company safe and skip the country. I'm giving the Wax Phantom scheme a 4 out of 5. Mr. Stevens used his position to know the best time to rob the safe, presumably after payroll and the monthly receipts came in. He had a patsy ready to take the blame and was able to successfully stage his own disappearance, which should have given him enough of a head start to make it safely out of the country. More on that later. A monster made entirely of wax was an original concept, as the scarier elements of paraffin had usually been delegated to hiding victims of foul play rather than being the instigator of such acts. Oh, Vincent Price again we do still run into the problem of the monster being miscategorized as a phantom, despite it not actually being a ghost. While the initial appearance of the villain does include the glowing effect, which admittedly it's nice to see again, that's the only time in the episode it's shown to do that. Originality aside, the costume itself isn't that scary. There's the pareidolia creepiness of a blob with a human face, but that's all it really has going for it. If you were to make a life-size model of the Wax Phantom and stick it on an elementary school playground, the boys would be taking turns jumping off its shoulders to try to impress the girls they have crushes on. Compared to, say, the Space Kook, put a life-size model of that on the playground and local bankruptcy cases would skyrocket from all the child psychology bills forcing parents to get second and third mortgages. How could that nine-foot wax guy just vanish? And with a hostage? 
one could argue that the size of the wax phantom was enough to instill fear in its victims. Being described by Velma as nine feet tall, anyone who wasn't Yao Ming would be intimidated. Another negative for the outfit is how messy it was, making a clean getaway both literally and figuratively impossible. Paraffin melts at roughly human body temperature, and surely running around chasing the kids was just going to raise the interior heat of the costume and start melting it from the inside. Don't call me Shirley. Judging from the amount of wax left on the floor after the wax phantom's first attack, the costume got warm enough to melt from simply trashing a few rooms. Though here the wax was probably left behind on purpose by the villain to establish the supernatural nature of the perpetrator. Although you'd expect Johnny Sands to be covered in wax from the phantom tying him up, but as we see here, he was spotless. There was an episode of What's New Scooby-Doo that also featured a monster made of a messy substance, and at that time, the lack of goo on a suspected victim was treated as a clue by Velma. More on that later. The originality of the wax phantom outweighs its lack of inherent spookiness, so Mr. Stevens gets a 3.5 out of 5 for the outfit. In fact, the wax phantom is so original, it would be three decades before another villain was such a creepy, waxy, lifeless appearance would capture the imagination of a horrified nation. Though still eventually ending up in the hands of the police, most of Mr. Stevens' scheme went off without a hitch. The wax fan successfully appeared on stage and trashed the studio. People were convinced the station manager was kidnapped. Johnny Sands was immobilized. The safe was robbed, and the villain made his getaway. It is an airline ticket. <laughs> to South America. That's a rather vague airline ticket. Does the plane just stop at a random country on that continent? Now if the wax phantom doesn't drop in on us... Yeah! <laughs> it looks like we did the dropping in. No windows or doors. The trap for sure. Hey, a secret panel! What'd you find? Money, and a lot of it. I see the wax phantom was big enough not to leave anything to cushion the fall of his trapdoor victims. Even that sex pest Dr. Jekyll was considered enough to put a mattress under his. The dropped airline ticket and the stolen loot being left for Velma to find were the obligatory villain missteps required by the Scooby writers to make sure that the gang could foil the criminal's plot, but Mr. Stevens' biggest mistake was probably remaining in town after staging his own disappearance. The smartest thing he could have done would be to commit his crime as close as possible to when his flight was scheduled so he would be able to leave the country immediately after the theft. By the time the authorities would be called to investigate, Mr. Stevens would be far away from the wax shower of justice. Perhaps Mr. Stevens had a good reason to stick around. Okay, that pun was intentional. I have two scenarios for why the station manager may have delayed his departure. The first being that he couldn't find his airline ticket. As the audience, we know that Velma found it and was likely holding on to it, but Mr. Stevens didn't. We know this because, as firmly established by the actions of the mummy and the creeper, the wax phantom wasn't chasing the gang while mumbling, TICKET! TICKET! The other scenario is that Mr. Stevens was waiting for his co-conspirator to join him. Why do I think someone else was involved in the crime? Hey, what was that? Scooby-Doo, where are you? As we see, Mr. Stevens was still behind the gang when the Wax Phantom first appeared, meaning he wasn't inside the costume. So who was? The lights were out for a very limited amount of time. Too limited, really, to allow Mr. Stevens to destroy the studio, knock out and tie up Johnny Sands, trash the office, steal the money from the safe, and escape to the Wax Museum. But what if the office was trashed and the safe robbed before the Wax Phantom appeared? That's the only way everything could have happened within such a short time frame. To be pedantic, unless you're a hyperactive four-year-old child, the literal four seconds the lights were off wasn't enough time to do even a tenth of the damage shown on screen, but we'll ignore that as just the usual Hanna-Barbera sloppy production mistake. After the gang found Johnny and mentioned calling the authorities, he convinced them not to, despite having been the victim of an assault. Further, while the wax phantom allegedly left messy wax footprints all over the office, 
there was no wax on the safe or anywhere else in the destroyed room. Nor was there any wax on Johnny, despite how messy it would have been for a creature made of paraffin to tie a rope. Speaking of the rope, here we see Johnny with his arm outside of it before Fred was done untying him. Johnny Sands was obviously Mr. Stevens' partner in crime. Do you need further evidence? Looking at this scene again, while Mr. Stevens is in the same room as the wax phantom, look who isn't. Johnny disappeared before the wax phantom showed up. Mr. Stevens was still hanging around after the crime because he was waiting for Johnny Sands to meet him at the wax museum and probably assumed Johnny had his airline ticket. After all, when a group leaves on vacation, it's common for all the tickets to be held by one member until they reach the airport. You'll also notice that Johnny Sands wasn't with the gang after the unmasking. In most Scooby-Doo episodes, all the suspects appear at the end to watch the villain get arrested. Johnny wasn't there because he still had his plane ticket and was currently on his way to an unspecified South American country. Johnny left empty-handed, but at least he was still free. Failing to catch the obvious other villain isn't the only mistake made by the Scooby gang in this episode. During the trapping phase, Fred makes use of a wax shower to capture the Phantom, inadvertently trapping Shaggy and Scooby as well. First of all, how in the hell is a wax shower used in the manufacture of wax figures? I looked all over the internet for an explanation and found nothing. If any Madame Tussauds employees happen to be watching this video and the wax shower is a real thing, please comment below. Anyway, as Shaggy and Scooby lead the wax fan to pass the shower, Fred turns the lever and unleashes hot, steaming, melted wax all over them. Wax figures are generally made from paraffin, which melts at around 100 degrees Fahrenheit, or bath water temperature. It has a boiling point of almost 700 degrees. Human skin starts to burn at around 115 degrees and is destroyed at temperatures above 200 degrees. We don't know how hot the melted wax is here, but it's hot enough to emit smoke, which means it has to be well over the temperature that would be safe for contact with human skin. Mr. Stevens had a costume to protect him from the initial wax downpour, but Shaggy and Scooby were completely exposed. The wax phantom did try to murder Shaggy and Scooby earlier by dropping them in a wax bath, which implies the temperature had to have been hot enough to kill. That is the face of a guy who just realized he's looking at 20 years for involuntary manslaughter. Even if the boys survive the scalding shower, paraffin wax takes at least one full day to harden like that, which means Shaggy, Scooby, and Mr. Stevens should have suffocated by the time Fred cracks open their airtight shells. Fred's fatal slip-up and potential imprisonment and a lifetime of PTSD resulting from being personally responsible for the horrifying deaths of three people aside, Mr. Stevens gets a score of 4 out of 5 for the operation. While he goofed up by losing his plane ticket and trapping Fred, Daphne, and Velma in the same room he hid his loot, trying to murder Shaggy and Scooby in one of the most gruesome ways possible earns him a lot of points for his dedication. This leaves the final villain of Scooby-Doo Where Are You with a do score of 3.8 out of 5. This also gives Mr. Stevens the highest score of all the villains in the second season, meaning the writers left the best for last. Fred and Daphne only know one dance, don't they? Like I thought it was an eating contest. Mmm, let's go. Who doesn't want dog hair in their taffy? Do something. Do something? Okay. <laughs> Did Shaggy and Scooby not realize their legs weren't bound? They could have simply stood up and jumped off the belt. And that's the final part of my villain ranking for Season 2 of Scooby-Doo or Are You? Here are the final results, including those from the previous episodes featured in my last video. I couldn't believe the Wax Phantom took the top spot either. Ranking the villains has been well received on my channel, so stay tuned for the next batch, which will likely cover 1972's The New Scooby-Doo Movies. So prepare for a lot of cringe moments involving old celebrities and possibly some of the lowest points in their careers. Thank you for watching. 
If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe and leave a comment below. Who am I kidding? No one watches to the end. I could safely confess to any number of crimes and not worry about getting caught. You know what, Mrs. Combs? It was me who peed on that tree in the playground back in second grade.